What's up? Today we're gonna take a look at an opening system, the King's Gambit, which will help you potentially to win 90% of the games that you play with the white pieces. And if that sounds too good to be true, think of this, we're gonna take a look at the games of Paul Morphy, who got the exact this result. So his success rate with the King's Gambit was through the roof, he won 9 games out of 10, in other words, playing this opening system, and we're gonna figure out how he could achieve such results and how you can replicate it. Here comes the first example, Morphe is playing white against Russo. Uh, so the King's Gambit starts off with a King's Pawn move, Pawn E4, Black responds Pawn E5, and here comes our King's Gambit move, Pawn to F4. Now, while it already challenges Black Center, the more kind of deeper strategic idea behind this move is that we open up the F-file, which gives us this long-term initiative against Black's King, and very often it results in quick attacks often crushing early in an opening. So let's see what happened next. In most cases, black captures here on f4, and white goes knight to f3. Not only this develops knight, but this also covers this h4 square so that black can't move their queen forward and check your king. Now, in this case, white's next move is probably gonna be pawn to d4, and then if black does nothing, white's gonna get their pawn back with bishop regaining this pawn on f4. For that reason, black often plays pawn to g5, which overprotects this pawn f4 and potentially threatens to march forward to g4, drive away this knight, enabling black to play queen h4 nevertheless. But Morphe plays pawn to h4, undermining this pawn chain so that later white can still play pawn d4 and bring the bishop out and get this pawn. Black goes pawn g4, makes sense chasing this knight, and Morphe goes knight to g5. Now, this potentially puts some pressure to this pawn, for example, if white adds bishop to c4 on the next move, in addition to that, potentially the queen is now ready to capture the other pawn on g4, which forces black to actually play something active to react somehow. By the way, the crazy thing which I've noticed while analyzing more of these games is that although they were played almost 200 years ago, they're still relevant. I've checked the database and it's crazy. Morpheus opponents play the exact same moves which are most common nowadays on amateur level. Therefore, you're highly likely to face the exact same moves of black if you play the king's gamut as white. Alright, so black goes pawn to h6, which makes sense as the knight is trapped here. But Morphe did not hesitate to sacrifice a material in order to get to opponent's king. And now white is sacrificing the knight in order to make this king completely exposed. It's quite a rare situation, by the way, if you look at the black's position where all the pieces are still on their original squares while the king is marching forward. Anyway, white here goes queen takes g4, getting one of the pawns back, and also potentially white is ready to capture the other one. So black goes queen f6 to support it, so that white cannot get this pawn back easily, and it's not just the pawn itself, rather it's a key to black's king. Now white goes bishop c4, check to the king, the king goes to e7, and now here comes knight to c3, bringing the knight into play and threatening knight d5, which would fork black's king and queen. And one of the really trademarks of Morphe's style, which was so efficient, is that he always tried to create this attack early in an opening while bringing more pieces into play. So knight c3 is a very common move for Morphe's style. He never just moved the same pieces over and over, kind of like people do in the scholars checkmate, but he always tried to bring up more and more reserves while simultaneously creating threats, and that was super effective. Anyway, right now black has to parry the, this direct threat of knight to d5, so he played pawn to c6. And um, think of this for a second, just so that you can also replicate Morphe's style more. Like, which move would you consider here, if you're playing white? I'm pretty sure a lot of players would castle here, blundering queen to d4 check, you know, which will double attack the king and bishop, so that's what most players would probably do anyway here. Uh, if not, they'd play some other move. Now, here's what Morphe does. He plays the move pawn to e5, which looks completely mind-blowing. Now white is giving out the pawn for seemingly no reason, moreover black can capture it with a check to the king, forcing it to move. It looks like completely bad. But there is another point, Morphe knew that in order to attack black's king you gotta open up files first, otherwise your own pawns as well as opponent's pawns are simply blocking files so that your pieces cannot start chasing your opponent's king. Therefore he was willing to make little material sacrifice in order to open up the files so that he can start this attack. And here he plays the move king to d1 enabling his rook to come to e1 in the future and attack both the queen and the king. Once again, black has to parry this direct threat, so he played king to d8, which kind of makes black moving back and forth and shuffle with his king and queen, while white brings more and more pieces into play, rook to e1, hitting the queen. Now the queen came to c5, trying to counterattack the bishop, but the bishop was happy to move and simultaneously grab the knight. Here black played another 
seemingly good looking move pawn to d5, which, you know, opens up the discovered check to the queen, but Morphy, true to his style, looked for ways to counterattack, and he found the move rook to e8 check, which forces the king to move, as well as distracts it from this bishop on c8, so that now I can capture it, and the king has only one square to move, king to e7, black keeps dancing with his king, and here comes another brilliant shot, knight takes d5. It turns out that black can now recapture the knight, because then it would open up white's queen to recapture his counterpart, and black would lose the queen. So black made the only move possible, king to d6, which resulted into the stunning checkmate queen to c7. There are also a few interesting facts about this game. First off, notice that in the final position of the game, black still has a bunch of his pieces that have never moved in this game, because Morphe has created more and more threats, never letting black to catch his breath and to do something constructive. And although Stockfish can find some errors in this game, also consider that Morphe played this game when he was only 12 years old, and he was a blindfold, meaning that he didn't look at the board while playing this game. In this second game, Morphe is playing white, of course, still, against his father, and Morphe was 10 years old here. Here, after pawn takes f4, Morphe played the bishop move bishop to c4. And I like it, first of all, because I'm biased and I love the bishop's opening anyway, and secondly, because, again, in most of the cases, which is absolutely crazy to think about, black play exactly same wrong moves as Morphe's father did. So he played queen h4, which is so far fine, checks white's king, but white actually vacated this square for his king so that it, it can hide it to f1. And although black forced white's king to move, on the next turn white is ready to play a knight of 3, push this queen back and gain some extra temples for his development. So it was an interesting idea of white, and bishop c4 again is the variation that I would highly recommend you to play. Especially because in this position, in most of the cases, black goes bishop c5. What the heck, they're going for the scholar's checkmate, right? <laughs> and if you're following my channel for some time, you know that it's one of our sweetest things to do to refute people who are trying to deliver this fool's checkmate against you. And usually the punishment is brutal, just like in this case. So first off, you go pawn to d4 to cut off this bishop, as well as to, you know, break this queen to f2 idea. Now the bishop has to move. Next, we bring the knight out, knight f3, forcing the queen to move. And after we go somewhere, it will usually give white even more extra temples. So black played queen to e7, kind of seemed to make sense. Now white goes knight c3, defending this pawn and potentially threatening to jump with the knight to d5 maybe in the future. Black responded knight f6, again makes sense, a developing move. And here it was more aggressive for white to push e5, kicking this knight away. Morphe played another move, which is also fine, queen d3 is a more solid way to protect this pawn on e4. And here black played pawn to c6, perhaps he was worried that in some variations white can start pressing forward with e5, you know, pushing this knight back away, then maybe knight d5, kicking the queen off. So black played this move pawn to c6, I guess, to stop white from jumping his knight there. But now white can get their pawn back, and usually in the king's gamut, if you can play that move, it means that you are already better, it means that your gamut was completely justified, because you got your gambit pawn back, and along the way you got this domination in the center, better development, etc. So now black is already feeling uncomfortable, because if he just tries to castle or whatever, I'll just press in the center with the move pawn e5, push this knight away, after that it's hard to ever develop this bishop from c8, and therefore black decided to play pawn to d5, perhaps to get some breathing space for his pieces. Anyway, white accepts the pawn, why not? This also opens up this file for the rook to come into play and to win black's queen actually, so black has to castle now. But now white can save his extra pawn by going pawn to d6, pushing this queen back and getting this nice passed pawn along the d file. After queen to d8, also ask yourself which move would you play here, okay? Because I know a lot of players in positions like that, they start worrying about their king and they start some like some like this h3 and trying to bring the king there, making the artificial casting. And while it's a perfectly reasonable idea, generally speaking, but again, like the nice thing which I think we can learn from Morphe is that he was so dominant over most of his opponents. He really crushed them, you see, even being a kid. He played simuls, he played blindfold simuls, he played old chess, giving his adult opponents an extra knight, an extra rook, and he still crushed them. And, of course, there were different reasons for that, but primarily he realized the key idea, the single key idea of a chess game, which is activity of your pieces. As much as you try to keep your pieces active, generally you dominate. So he played the move rook to e1, and as you can see in all the games that he played, he's trying to bring all his pieces into play as quickly as possible. Now black played rook e8, trying to do the same, and by the way, if not, maybe white would even be able to enter 
the seventh rank after rook to e7, so rook e8 makes sense. But now it goes knight g5, saying, hey, it's nice that you want to control the e file, but now your f7 pawn is handy. Black traded on e1, king takes. Morphe didn't worry about his king being exposed because black is simply undeveloped and there is no way for black to take advantage of that anyway. Black played queen e8, check to the king. Morphe says thank you, the king will stand better here, plus it will give me the, another chance to bring my rook into play with the tempo. Black still has to parry this threat to his f7 pawn, so he played bishop to e6. And now, if you're following me for some time, you know the rule to take is a mistake, right? You don't have to take unless there is a particular reason, particular advantage, particular benefit that you gain out of it. So Morphe just played rook e1, bringing another piece into play and keeping it flexible. The bishop can't move anyway, it's pinned down to the queen, and on the next turn white can decide how he wants to capture this bishop. Black played knight to d7, trying to finalize his development, but it was too late, because on the next move after this exchange, black had to resign. Now the rook is attacking the queen, plus it sets it up for some discovered check on the next move. For instance, if the queen moves somewhere here, it even may lead to this beautiful uh, checkmate with the move rook to e8. So that's another great example how Morphe played the king's gambit. And again, it's uh, not just about general ideas. You can replicate the exact same moves and they'll often lead you to very similar victories. And in the final game, Morph is playing white against Bird, playing black. By the way, Bird was a pretty strong player and quite famous at the time. In fact, you've probably heard about the Bird's opening and it's called after this guy. But here, Morphe plays the same move against him, just on the second move with the King's Gambit. So pawn takes, knight of f3, we know that it is the usual move. Although bishop c4, as we discussed previously, is also a very interesting alternative that you can definitely give it a try. Anyway, here black in most cases goes pawn to g5, pawn h4, pawn g4, and we saw one example where he played knight to g5, and in this game he decided to play knight e5, which is another good alternative just as well. From here it potentially puts pressure to this pawn, or maybe he's ready to change his mind, go back and capture this pawn on g4. Now black goes knight of 6, here comes bishop c4. One of the key ideas of the king's gamut is to pressure this pawn. Initially you can do this with the knight and bishop, and later after you castle your rook can join the party and start putting pressure there. Anyway, right now black has to defend his pawn, so he goes pawn d5, white captures, and black goes bishop to d6. You can see that black is indeed a stronger player, and in this case he's not trying to grab as much material as he can, so he refuses to just get the pawn back, he instead wants to develop his pieces quickly, which is generally the right chess strategy. Now Morphe goes pawn to d4, solidifying his knight, also this opens up the bishop to get back this gambit pawn, so black goes knight h5 in order to defend it. Now, Morphe simply goes knight to c3, developing the knight, black goes bishop f5, also developing a bishop, maybe he wanted to control the square just in case, and in this position, the situation is slightly tricky, it's not that easy to find the right move. Morphe played the move knight e2, which makes sense, he wants to put more pressure onto this pawn. Stockwell shows that there was actually a spectacular way for white to get the pawn back immediately, but it's not easy to see it. It's a tactical short bishop takes f4. And at first looks like white is just blundering in peace for no reason. But it turns out that after knight takes, white can actually castle, and our castling has never been that powerful. Just look at this, our rook currently attacks the knight, also x-rays the bishop as well as this pawn on f7, meaning that on the next move white will get back one of these minor pieces, and then will continue his crushing attack on the king side. So that would be like the exact perfect example of the king's gambit strategy. Morphe didn't notice this tactic because it was indeed quite complicated. He played a more normal looking move knight to e2, just double attacking this pawn on f4 and hoping to get it with you know, simple moves. Now it's not that easy for black to defend it, therefore bird decided to trade the knight on e5 so that it no longer defends the square at 3 and after that he pushed the pawn forward. So this way he's saving the pawn and is also disturbing white's knight and white's king side overall. Now Morphe traded there and after that instead of moving the knight you, you may think about that yourself for a second, what would you play here? The key idea is that you always try to attack and counterattack. So he played the move bishop g5, counterattacking black's queen and gaining one tempo. Black decided to go for it, played pawn f6, and after white captured, here black realized that although he could possibly take the knight, it probably doesn't really give anything good to black anyway, because after pawn takes, white can simply recapture, and this hits the king as well as this knight, so at the very least, while get their 
uh, piece back right on the next move. But in addition to that, there is this nasty pawn f7 coming potentially, opening up another attack. And just by the amount of arrows that I drawn here, you can see that black's in trouble. Bird realized that as well. And instead of capturing the knight, he played queen d6. Also quite tricky. The queen is sitting here in, a, in an ambush, waiting for white's knight to move away so that the queen can jump here to g3 and start counterattacking. So this makes the game pretty cool. Both players are finding interesting ways to counterattack each other. White played queen d4, and I like that. Like, very solid move to centralize the queen and just saying, hey, I don't care, I want to develop my own attack. So from d4, the queen is potentially ready to play pawn f7 and then to grab this rook on h8. Maybe white is ready to even castle queenside if black does nothing. And yeah, then white will be fully mobilized and ready to attack black. Anyway, for now black captured the knight so that, you know, black first of all just grabs an extra piece and secondly, because of this pawn, white can no longer castle. So white took the pawn, which also hits this knight on h5, forcing black to make some moves. Black played queen g3, check to the king, and white played king to d2. Again, I see that it's a common thing that usually people think that if the king stands in the middle of the board, that is just some horrible situation. But as long as your opponent does not have many pieces around you, your king is usually safe. Because in order for his attack to be successful, he's got to outnumber you. He's got to have more attackers compared to the quantity of defenders. And in this case, black is like really having maybe these two pieces taken part into this potential attack. And white has many. White has like two bishops and queen and, and rooks are ready to join. So here white is clearly out of danger. In fact, black's in danger because now, you know, this knight is hanging. Also, the king is in the middle of the board. F7 is coming, attacking this rook on h8. Black decided to castle, at least putting his rook to safety. But after rook to g1, black resigned, because now the queen is attacked. If the queen moves, there will be various kinds of discovered checks along the g-file. White could also pick up this knight. I guess the easiest is simply to play a bishop of 4, check to the king, then pick up the queen, then pick up the knight and destroy everything. So black just resigned. If you got excited about the King's Gambit and want to give it a try in your Blitz games, you may wish to check out this video where I'm sharing with you top 5 quickest checkmates in the King's Gambit so that you can learn some other additional common attacking patterns. Keep crushing it and I'll talk to you soon.